Hi, welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. <laughs> Puddles is uh, coming to us remotely from back in Eugene. He's working out with a football team. They're starting their daily doubles. But we're in Rockville, Maryland with Judy Saxton. Judy, thanks so much for stopping in. You're welcome. It's great to, great to see you. Glad it worked out. Uh, Judy, uh, Judy and I knew each other from Chicago days, and you actually room with my, uh, my late wife for three weeks at NOI, summer of 1990. Yeah, crazy connections. It's amazing, the circular, circular parts of life. Yes, definitely. But uh, Judy is the uh, trumpet mm -hmm. professor at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts and on the faculty at the Eastern Music Festival mm -hmm. in uh, Greensboro. Yes. North Carolina. Yeah, the school's over in Winston-Salem. I'm one of the only musicians I know that get to do both in one place. And she studied with Arnold Jacobs. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm wondering, do you, uh, do you recall what drew you to Jacobs <clears throat> initially? What was that? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Um, I wonder, I don't think, Mr. I'm just wondering if Mr. Jacobs might have said, you know, you could, but I don't think so. I think it was just uh, word on the street. I was my year at Northwestern, I was also the first associate in civic. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was plugged in, and I was in Millar, Brass Ensemble. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of plugged into all the big brass guys. And I think probably I just got told to go see him by friends. But, um, and you know, everybody said what the first lesson would be like, which you can't really remember the, I don't remember the first lesson, really. I remember the whole conglomeration of lessons, but. Um, what would you say um, amongst those, those initial times that you, that you had with Jacobs? What, what did you come up with? What are some of your big memories? It was a while ago, but yeah. I'm sure there's some memories. Um, kind of a, well, a full body, holistic mind, body approach mm. to teaching. Um, with a ton of knowledge that he sh had and shared about about that, about how the mind learns and the body, which was, and kind of, he seemed to be the end of the road resource. Like, he just seemed to know, I mean, all those gentlemen instilled a lot of trust because of their experience, but with Jake, it seemed like he was the end all to know how the brain really functioned and how the body functioned. So, um, but, I didn't have a period of awe. Like I remember I was young and kind of the youngest in my class and from a great but small school and so Mansfield State. Yeah, Mansfield University. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have um, any experience with anyone in Chicago before going out there, which was very different than anybody else in my class. Mm -hmm. So with Chicowitz I was like oh, just for the first few lessons, you know. Actually I dressed up for like the whole first term. <laughs> but with Jacobs it was more like you know, you had to pay him a, a lot of money. <laughs> it was a big check. For those so days, yeah. I, that was meant a lot to me at then, like really. Yeah. And so I was just there to kind of take it all in. And that kind of created more of a, I think maybe an intensity on my part mm -hmm. or something. And also just forget the wow factor. I was like, how can you help me? You wanted to get your money's worth. I did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, and I wanted to know what was what he would, I guess, just assess me. I knew I could play nicely, and I knew I had a pretty sound. There were certainly things I struggled with, um, but I was really surprised the first couple times um, I went. Should I go on? Like, yeah. So he told me I was breathing backwards. I don't know that many people know this about me, but I do share it with my students when it comes up. They don't really believe it because they think, you know, that how I am now is how I was then. Yeah. <laughs> but I was... Uh, what is backwards breathing? Now I have to really think about it. You probably I was did. pushing out all the time, basically, to breathe in mm -hmm. and to breathe out. And I was like, I remember because, like, you know, I was very literal, and my sixth grade teacher told me to do that. It's in right. my notes. Right. And so you have sixth grade notes. Oh yeah, you know, like from the lessons. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's it. Keep going. <laughs> so. Um, I was like, it was not what I, ex I didn't expect that at all. Yeah. I thought he would help me with my high range, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. And he was like, well, I can see you've got this apparatus is working backwards and we have to go around fixing that. So he wanted me to come for a series of six lessons, um, 
kind of sequentially and I was one of many I'm uh, student sure students to disappoint him I could not afford that at mm -hmm. all um, I had loans out and um, I just couldn't afford it so I would go whenever I got a wedding <laughs> it was the same amount of money and I would just give him the money and so but I obviously did what he said though in between and I got the various contraptions and I did them all a lot so I could reverse literally this process I had learned right right and um, certainly throughout that time so that I didn't get stuck thinking of the physical um, he would talk all the time about herself who I actually I mean I probably listened to the CSO more than anyone else in my year on any brass instrument because I was a um, an, an usher. You were an Andy oh, Frainer? I was an Andy Frain usher. And I remember the first time I went, actually I went in the summer before it even started, I went to hear Bruckner 7. I was like, wow, this is a great piece with lots of brass and it repeats a lot. <laughs> I didn't know it at all. Yeah. But um, I remember like, they played Beethoven 9 and I didn't know where that sound was coming from with Dan. Oh, mm -hmm. I couldn't find the sound for like two performances. Wow. It didn't even sound like a horn. Well, but, so, so you probably, you probably, uh, did he tell you your gut was tight or you need, no. you need to keep it loose? What did he? He told me, um, I had to practice um, uh, being nine months pregnant and then I had to do things away from breathing at all. Yeah. Um, nine months pregnant and emaciated were his words, as I recall, mm -hmm. um, without even breathing. I think just to revert, to literally get the musculature willing and able to go there. Yeah, just to start thinking in those ways. Yeah. Right. And when I, and then he would talk a lot about sucking wind into the blips for me and how I didn't need to think about anything else, that this would take care of everything. And then he would guide, you know, with his hands and he would have me put his hand on his very hugely protruding, like he could make things move a ton. Yeah, yes. And that was for me i think i'm visual and kinetic and aural so i was like you know that was a real eye-opener mm -hmm. how much you could move because i probably wasn't moving much would be my fairly guess. static in your i bet in your... i really bet because i was pretty tight and tense and intense and i'm imagining that i wasn't moving much <laughs> so when you when when that became effective when you're able to reverse course what did you notice with your trumpet playing? Well, um, if, if through the course of the lessons, even though we were working on that, it would only be for, I recall, part of the lesson. And most of the rest was getting me to, um, I was, I'm, was an RM, a very fine singer, so he would just have me, and he also did some things with imagination. Um, and he kept asking me to access that. Like, in other words, I just want to make sure that his portrait that his lessons were not for me, really weren't all physical at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that they really were getting me to be, even though I was singing through my trumpet, you know, I had some different head trips and maybe I wasn't singing clearly enough and it gave me a lot of ways to kind of start things and get going. So what I found in the lessons and the results from the lessons was um initially a lot of frustration to be honest sure yeah. i wanted to get it right away and i would go away really upset because i could get it intellectually and mm -hmm. i couldn't get it all physically and so i think in time this did reverse itself mm -hmm. and you know it wasn't that my playing was so impaired previously no. because of the level i was yeah. In other words, I wasn't playing principal in an orchestra at that time. Maybe I was, but it was a smaller orchestra. So I don't recall a huge shift except more freedom, more flexibility. Judy, you just mentioned that uh, uh, your initial times with Jake were not uh, strictly physical, although there was a, a, a large portion of the lessons um, mental, psychological? Yeah. Um, um, a lot of asking for more lyricism and everything and a lot of like um one two three one 
like putting words and numbers was ex especially helpful for my overactive mind. Mm. <laughs> Super helpful. I never really gotten that specific before, and yeah. it really helped um, it probably replace, as opposed to calm, all the blah, blah going on. But that was a biggie for Mahler 5, 1, 2, 3, 1. So just thinking one, two, that three, while one. you're playing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. And then um, starting out, um, conjuring up the sound. I mean, many, many people speak about this, the sound of Herseth which I had ringing in my ear very true, and then you'd kind of go in and be you anyway, and he'd stop you immediately and say, I don't think that's Mr. Herseth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Bud sounds like that. So it was just kind of establishing that freedom to really let go and really trust your imagination. So for me, it was, of course, a big trust thing, and also uh, no numbers, Note names with letters. Can you solfege? Um, I already could solfege a ton, and I had a great ear. So he didn't do that so much with me. It actually slowed me down, like to put the solfege to the. Okay. Did you remember so if he asked you initially, and then he found out that it was slowing you down? Or? Um, I didn't need to do it. Okay. Because I just heard everything and could sing everything. I mean, I I, I think that's why he didn't go into it with me. Yeah. And when I would call him for lessons, I think this is important to note because it's related to Jacob's. Um, he would always say, oh, you don't need a lesson from me. I think he told a lot of people this because he got overwhelmed. Yeah. But also, he'd say, why, you can just sing through that trumpet. You have a beautiful voice. Just make sure you're connecting it to the trumpet. And all of us, this was back when there was pay phones, and we'd find the money, we'd put in the pay phone, yeah. and then we'd sit there and you could just, like when you heard his voice. Yeah. And that resonance, yeah, it was, therapeutic. It, it was just his voice and, of course, his way of being with so much knowledge. <laughs> he really was kind of like a Dalai Lama of teaching because was, you felt yeah. that. You felt calm in Shikowitz's presence, too, but with Jacob's, um, it was, of course, they're different men. It was just different. Do you remember, do you remember, um, did he give you a, a reason? Did he explain to you why put numbers and words to the notes, or did he I just... think he might have. I think, because um, I was always saying, why, you know? <laughs> 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 I don't know if I really was. I trusted him a lot, but I probably did inject a couple of those because I was interested. Yeah. I wasn't one of those that wanted to learn how to teach, so I just wanted to know for me. Right. <laughs> I have to be clear about that. Right. I was very selfish at that point. But um, uh, I think he was saying, this will help you to just focus, or at least that's what I got from it that I thought he said, like, this will help you to focus, to get things to just, because things would come in two or three notes later. Mm -hmm. And to get that initial start um, fully formed, you know, right two, away. one, four, five, whatever it is, yeah. would help. Um, so quality from the very first note. Absolutely, that was a biggie, biggie, biggie for me. Um, that was a that was one of the biggest things. Yeah. To that was part of the trust issue, and I think initially part of this issue. Okay. Yeah. Did he have you uh, buzzing the mouthpiece much? Yep. Okay. Yeah, and I'd already been doing that, so that seemed comfortable and wonderful. And he would um, he would sometimes buzz on his mouthpiece, which would be like, and he would just encourage me to do it with vaudevillian sound and lots of you know and glissando and yeah which i loved doing i was on stage and i had no problem doing that so i had no reticence i know some of my students have lots of reticence but it's important to just dive in yeah. and that's i think part of it yeah and yeah the vaudevillian style absolutely and the, the glissando yeah and i think to go from that to the piece of metal and recognizing that what you put in there is the same thing, and you can change so many habits away from that instrument yep. on the mouthpiece right. without the ha habits kicking in so strongly. And so I know we did a lot of mouthpiece work. Um, yeah, I think he might have even had me, I don't know if I came up with that or if he did, holding the mouthpiece with my non-dominant hand, mm -hmm. just to kind of get away from any other habits. Right. I think he might have interjected so, that. Disarm those neural pathways yeah. that were associated with the dominant hand. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So um, most of the time, um, I remember I had to learn to breathe up here too. Yes. Um, I was pretty stuck. I'm sure in every way, <laughs> and that's I think was a great frustration for me. But I remember, most women remember <laughs> him putting his hand right there. Yeah, right. And you know. But it was important right. to be able to, as he used to say, Dolly Parton breathing, um, to get this movement. area um, activated and yeah. moving. Um, yeah. And of course, going to the extremes, he talked a lot about that, the pendulum and going to the extremes. We go to extremes but to establish normalcy. Yeah. So don't worry about going all the way over here. Right. It will come back to where it needs to be based on the sound. Yeah. And the sound was always super strong for me. It was just the initial letting go of the control. The letting go. Yeah. Yeah. But I haven't had any problems with the sound. That's probably why he was always like, you're not going to have any problems. With I that. remember talking about, you know, it's, it's basically, it's, what I'm talking about here is, is essentially two shades of gray. What I'm trying to get you to realize is to separate into a black and white. Right. That was um, the pendulum yeah, thing I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. And so then we get it separated in black and white, and then we can... Then we, the two shades of gray become much more visible. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if this is going to come up, but is um, when I got my job in Hong Kong, I went back to the symphony and I talked with a number of the players there because I didn't know where Hong Kong was or anything. It was ridiculous. And I was like, it's principal trumpet in the Hong Kong Philharmonic. And I remember getting a lot of advice um, that I should take the job. But I remember before I left, literally right before I left, probably to go to NOI to mm -hmm. then go on to Hong Kong, um, the best advice I've ever gotten in my entire career about life and especially music came from Mr. Jacobs. Wow. And I'm not a person that remembers quotes word for word. I mean, with Jacobs, we remember some things because he repeated it a lot. Yeah. Um, but what he told me was, wherever you go, Whatever you do, keep your standards high. Mm -hmm. That is the best advice Yes. for every situation. Yeah, and that can be hard to do I mean, when you I've, leave Chicago or New York. or I've left situations. Yeah. I've made decisions based on that yeah. because of the way I've wanted to be as a musician. Yeah. Um, and I, and it, it doesn't always flow easy with everyone around you because you want to be this level all the time. And mm -hmm. it's not like you're intense about it. You just you just project that level. Yeah. And um, you hope to rise the boats around you with that. But I think it's fantastic advice. And certainly the kind that could be applied going off into the situation. Yeah. Any, anything that you do, really. Yeah. Yeah. Judy, I um, uh, often I'll ask when as a I'm interviewing a high brass player, I'll ask them how did that how did that work out studying with a you know a, a tuba player. Um, so it's such a big difference. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you would think how strange is that? Um, again, the community of players there had already convinced me it was going to be fine. But what what in my lessons what really came to the fore was because of my rigidity and kind of a lot of that isometric tension, mm -hmm. we talked a lot about movement of wind and movement of the body mm -hmm. that corresponds with that. And um, taking what was great in the middle register and just bringing that on up with lots of, he said, you know, I always get these backwards, I have to stop. We are a high pressure, low flow instrument Right. And there is no negating that, except that we can bring so much more thick wind to that. Yeah. I remember working on Chike 4 with him, right. which is, you know, full and loud and kind of high, you know, mm -hmm. A-flat. Yeah. And him talking about buzzing all the way across, and doing it, all the way across the embouchure with thick, thick air and providing much more than just a thin wind stream. Mm -hmm. And that helped, because like I say, I could hear it and everything, but the physical, getting that much wind that was not like a tiny, you think, dee, 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 but yeah. it's to go, yaw, and 
to have that fullness there. That helped that kind of extreme thing. And then I also remember, in terms of articulating mm -hmm. and everything, then I also remember him speaking to going, ascending into the upper register. He helped me a lot with, this helped me a ton. I think it came from him. Because I've modified some of this or done it differently later in my career with my students. But I'm pretty darn sure he would say, Tia. Because on the mm. upper register, if we think ah only, it doesn't really fly, okay. frankly. On the trumpet. Yeah, yeah. on the trumpet. <laughs> so if we're going up there, um, your oral cavity is still too open. Too much. And the, most of our stuff up there, we have to be able to articulate in a lyrical fashion. So I remember him working specifically with me, just think cha, which was T to get it started, and then ah to open up. And I know I took a couple lessons with him, one lesson specifically on, on piccolo. Yeah. It might have been when you did that, but I kind of almost think it was when I was, you know, struggling with the upper register, as yeah. I often did. I had an upper register, but um, I didn't have a lot of comfort. You can have comfort in the upper register on the trumpet. Yeah. And I just didn't have that. So that was super helpful, along with being really literally maintaining the lyricism and not viewing it as something physical to do. I, I mean, something I'm always cur curious with, with trumpet players is this the whole the whole compression thing. And, and coming from the coming from my background with Jacobs, you know, it's all about flow, it's all about shape change, you know, because you're if you're just it's always the same shape, then there isn't gonna be you're not gonna have much flow of air. So you need that 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 shape change of uh, in order to get the You mean in your oral air. cavity? No, no. In your, in your body. In your body, flowing the air. Right. But with, with trumpet, yeah. with, I mean, there's a lot of compression. Well, you know, that's the thing. There will be that anyway. So we worked all on increasing the amount of wind that you have to deal with. Not just taking a bigger breath, yes, but then when you turn it around, keeping the breath full and thick. Mm -hmm. Which, which also increases the deflation. I remember him saying to me, let that deflate, let that deflate. While you're playing. Yes, because... Don't hold the air. Which creates more compression when right. you hold the air. When you deflate, you've got so much pressure from the instrument, it's only going to deflate at the amount and the pitch level of that sound and you know pitch. Even if you're doing a higher pitch, if you're compressing, you are holding almost the well, same. That's interesting. Big. I remember him saying that uh, the br there's a pl part of the brain. He said the biocomputer level. Yeah. Or whatever that is. Right. Um, that takes takes the excess air and gets rid of it, n not a, on a conscious basis, but it gets rid of that excess air. You don't have to. But if you take too little air, that creates problems. So right. Having too much air doesn't cause a problem. And this is sort of going down that road that you're talking right. about. Right, absolutely. Because a lot of times if I'll talk to trumpet players, I'll say, take a bigger breath. They'll say, well, I'm just holding on to it. Oh, and yeah, That makes yeah. me uncomfortable. Oh, no. Okay, I probably said that because I remember his reply to that was um, the whole balance thing with, and this is how he luckily explained it to me because I wouldn't have gotten it any other way. It was, take a breath, be surprised. Oh, yeah. There, right. it's balanced. Right. You have already created that, and I could just say the word balance because I get so confused whenever I describe it any other way. Uh, you've already created the right stasis between the pressurization outside and inside, mm -hmm. and oh, it's that difference, or oh, or I'm bearing down waiting for it to go. Mm. So it's right. that idea of you can pause when you're surprised, and here I am. I can speak from here. Right. You know, I can do all these. Oh, I can, I can buzz. I can do everything from here. Right. Rather than, you know, exactly. any of the valsalva or right. or even the, you know, pressurization from all the other mechanical means that we yeah. do. So, um, yeah. Well, this is really interesting because I, I know he said um, um, with airflow, there's always going to be pressure. Right. Right. But with pressure, there may not always be airflow. Absolutely. 
I remember him saying this to me too. And so that's sort of increasing the wind flow, yeah. and again that movement and the flow. And I remember thinking, this is so similar to Jacobs or Chickowitz, yeah. like the way he spoke about flow and everything. But I thought, and this is nothing against Mr. Chickowitz. It's just that Jacobs took it further. Mm. Jacobs took this breath patterns, which are very helpful. Yep. But he took that concept. Again, whole body and brain and mind, just physically further. I think he had the physical knowledge and anatomical knowledge and the physiological, psychological knowledge um, to do that. Yeah. So he would ask you to do more with that idea of flow. I know certainly we worked on one thirds, two thirds, three thirds in my mm -hmm. lesson. We worked on five, four breathing. The breathing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Five out, four, or one, two, three, four, and then in on five to get faster, bigger, fuller replacements of breath. Because mm -hmm. that was another thing, when you're rigid, you can't replace as quickly, which was why my upper register was also, you know, just not. I needed more wind, and I was so compressed all the time. Did he talk about, as, since you were, you're a trumpet player, did he talk to you about not needing as much air as he would on a tuba, or did that come up? I think, you know, his whole thing about the low C being the same on every instrument, he mentioned that, but he said, for you, I just want you to be sure that you have the psychology of movement and breath to enable you to, you know, get the sound and the fullness of sound that you're, that is required in an orchestra. Yeah. Judy, you mentioned uh, off camera that, that uh, you know, you had your groups of lessons over the 10 year period, sort of in, I guess, clumps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the last set, mm -hmm. um, what were those like for you? Sure. Um, I remember a specific lesson on piccolo I mentioned, and it was just interesting because he had told me specifically, again, maybe because I needed to hear it, to approach it like my big B flat and to use the same quantities of air and that, and what you referred to earlier about where does all that extra air go, not to even think about it. And it was fascinating because I had had a lesson the same week on piccolo from who basically is known to just say literally don't breathe. Oh, okay. And it's really small. And you can play the piccolo like that, too. Mm -hmm. And I remember applying it immediately to a wedding. And I felt so much more comfortable with my body signals with the full breath. And I've played like that ever since. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one thing I remember specifically was playing the piccolo with the same amount of buzz and thickness and vibration and fullness of, of wind. Mm -hmm. And we spoke a lot about vibration um, and movement in general. And then what? I can't remember what I was going to talk about. It was the no. You were <laughs> you were you were thinking about the uh, imagination. Oh yeah. So then the other thing that was addressed for me quite a bit in those later lessons, where I would kind of go back in for an occasional um, coaching. coaching on some excerpts I was taking, would be these reminders of the storytelling component um, and having that um, so vivid and so clearly imagined right from the start and being involved in that full bow playing as part of the storytelling like you know whatever it may be mm -hmm. um, kind of inhabiting even if you're going from I think I worked on some lyric opera stuff with him I remember some opera excerpts from Don Pasquale, you know, cornet solo to something more um, vividly articulate. Mm -hmm. And always when going into the articulation on the trumpet specifically, I think, um, maintaining that vibration that and resonance. that thickness and the resonance and the fullness, these are the words that kind of cued me up. And it's an awe vowel, but it's more, it's singing. It's really literally singing. Yeah. Um, through the note, at the beginning of the note and through the note. You know, if you were going to da da dum dum da 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 dum da da dee. So it's all long and through and um, and then just those ways of getting getting started again, the juicing up the imagination um, and hearing so clearly in your head exactly what you want. Not just kind of like, oh, that pretty sound from Herseth, but like seeing Herseth. Mm. and being her set and like inhabiting how he sat on stage mm -hmm. and just literally turning red and you could you could totally do that you yeah. could just 
decide, okay, and then you kind of get that rah, and you're like, rah, and it really works, yeah. you know? So, like an actor or and actress. he would say, yeah. um, you can become, oh, and I think another thing he would do was have your four people, I would be like Phil Smith, Tim Morrison, Herseth, and whoever else I was studying with at that time, um, play the note before me in time. Ba, boo, bee, bum, ba. Well, that's a great technique. I, oh, yeah. I hadn't heard about the That might have like come from Scarlet, but, but it still came from Jacobs. Jacobs yeah. I can't quite remember because it's all Jacobs, really, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, that's especially helpful. That is, that is helpful. That's and I helpful. remember, if, if I can bring her into it, I went up to try trombones with Debbie Taylor to the shop up in Edwards or wherever. Yeah. And I remember I would fling out a name. I'd say, be this person. And she was like 100% that person it was so amazing the sound change and because it was another instrument I maybe heard it even more because I yeah. didn't have any hang-ups with it yeah but I can I mean I still do that I do all of this stuff to this day um, and I can demonstrate it for my students and they're like well why aren't you like but herself all the time then if you like to be but and I said because I'm a budlet <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like duty but <laughs> but that concept of sound is still what kind of fuels me yeah um, and this, because I bought into that, I really, that was my, I, you know, that was kind of really what I wanted to sound like. And um, with the Civic and with all those sectionals and then hearing them so much in the orchestra, sometimes two and three repeats of the show. Mm -hmm. And then um, with Jacobs, encourage, not only encouraging, but saying, this is so critical to get it so specific, clear musical message. He talked a lot about the seventh cranial nerve and how I tell people to this day they still don't know and they're shocked and appalled and, and not appalled. They're shocked and astounded by it's the exact same neural pathway that goes either to your vocal cords or to your lips. So when you sing, right. it's literally the same thing as when you play. Right, and when you sing, it goes down the laryngeal nerve to the larynx. When you play, it goes, it goes to the seventh cranial nerve to the lips. Yeah. But I think but it's it starts the same. In, it starts in the same place. Yeah. It starts in the same place. Yeah. So maybe I said it a little wrong. But no, it was great. It was just really... So, and the results, of course, in the lesson, um, and outside of the lesson, it was always a little ephemeral because for me, of course, my whole time was learning to let go and not control and not recreate uh, that feeling or something. Um, he talked a lot about that. You know, you don't play by feel and you have to play by sound mm -hmm. and so we did a lot of stuff with movement I'm remembering that now tons of stuff bringing movement into the into oh the like yeah to start the note yeah. with my foot and yeah. my yes bum. Right. Um, we did a ton of things like that uh, this was the breath so you could see it yeah and that was super, super helpful. Breath and thirds. Even, yeah. even with, um, you know, soft entrances. And it had, you know, even if it had to go out, it wasn't just for first entrances. Yeah. But to keep things moving through. Again, I use all of this with my students. Um, I give them credit all the time. Uh, but that's a biggie. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, I was in Hong Kong and it came back after my first year with a very dictatorial, tough conductor, David Atherton. And I had huge trouble, not during, but like I knew I was nowhere near the same kind of player as when I'd left Chicago in uh. one year. And I was flying through Chicago on my break during Jacob's week. At Northwestern? Yes. He said, well, this is highly unusual, but I'm sure we can fit you in. So he fit me in and worked with me because I was so stuck mm -hmm. by the way this guy conducted without yeah. any breath yeah. up at all. And uh, um, and just, you know, I was principal and I had a second player that didn't talk to me. <laughs> a lot of stuff. So yeah. um, he worked with me. He worked me in just because it was the only time I said, I'll take a lesson with you outside and there was no time. And it was incredibly helpful just playing five minutes 
I remember I missed the top note in pictures. But I, still, I still remember. But I was so tight, and he was like working with me mm-hmm. in front of everybody as that worked out to yeah. do that. Um, and he said, well, as you can see, I mean, you know, you're then an example for everybody. Right. What happens when you have this isometric, which kind of had come back due to the situation. Yeah. But I was able to kick that through the reminder. That's great. Right. Thanks for remembering that. Yeah. Then and now. Yeah. Well, look, Judy, I can't uh, thank you enough for taking time. Judy's passing through Rockville, Maryland, and uh, on her way to visit your mother. And uh, thank you so much for, yeah. for taking the time. Puddles, as usual, he uh, bears gifts, even though he's uh, remote. He'd like for you to have this uh, match set of University of Oregon duck reusable shopping bags. I will gladly use them and support the ducks everywhere. <laughs> I'll put music Do you that in puddles? them. Go dogs! <laughs> thank you, thank you, Judy. Absolutely. It's great to see you. Great to see you too. And now back to you. <laughs>